I'd like to begin by explaining uh, why we call it the Athenaeum Symposia. In ancient Greece, Athens, of course, was the capital, and Athena was the goddess of wisdom. And so we have chosen to, the first word in the Athenaeum Symposia is derived from Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And we know that in each of our events, we will be gaining bits of wisdom. We know that Don Bliss is going to share us wisdom tonight with us about Mark Twain. Uh, the word symposia is also an ancient Greek word, uh, which means a gathering of people to discuss ideas and to enjoy intellectual discussion. So since we will be having a question and answer session at the end, we will be discussing ideas as well. And so that is the reason we call this the Athenaeum Symposia. To begin the evening, uh, we're going to have Dr. Joe Thompson, who is chair of our history department, and we're really proud of everything that he does. And he is going to introduce our speaker, uh, Don Bliss. Dr. Thompson. Dr. Rye asked if I was nervous, and I, and I do this for a living, but now I'm nervous. Why did you do that to me? That was terrible. Um, tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce Donald Bliss. Mr. Bliss is a Harvard-trained, a Washington, D.C.-based attorney who has dedicated much of his public life, or almost all of his public life, to public service, uh, beginning with uh, 1966, joining the Peace Corps. Very good. Uh, you finished that in 1968, I believe, right? Um, since then, he's worked for several government agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agency and the State Department, and has represented the United States on the Council of the International Civic Aviation Organization based in Montreal, Canada. And it is in this capacity that he's earned the, uh, the honorarium ambassador. So we are welcoming an ambassador uh, to our midst. His resume is impressive. I shortened it because I uh, don't want to bore you too much with it, but it's, it's very impressive. But tonight, Ambassador Bliss is not here as a lawyer or a public servant uh, or, a, or an ambassador. He is here as a historian, and so he has earned my respect. All that other stuff doesn't really matter. Um, and he is here as a historian to speak of America's greatest uh, writer, Mark Twain. Apologies to Stephen King. Uh, <laughs> and John Grisham. He's a good one. Um, Mr. Bliss is uniquely qualified to do that. He is the uh, great-grandson of one of Mark Twain's publishers. He is the author of a play about Mark Twain, The Return of Halley's Comet, and is currently working on a book about Twain and politics, and that will be the subject of tonight's uh, discussion. I am told also that Mr. Uh, Bliss is a patron of the arts, and he has an impressive personal library of first edition Mark Twain's, which is much better than my dog-eared copy of Puddinhead Wilson, which uh, my students still kind of find funny. Anyway, uh, tonight Mr. Bliss is here to talk about the subject of his most recent research, the politics of Mark Twain, so I'm going to ask everyone to please give him a good Montgomery College welcome, <laughs> Ambassador Donald Bliss. Well, thank you, Joe, for that gracious introduction. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, if any of you were expecting Hal Holbrook, I apologize. Uh, as a Mark Twain impersonator, I'm a complete failure. Um, and if I say anything controversial that offends you, well, that wouldn't have bothered Mark Twain, so it's not going to bother me. <laughs> I'm going to read my remarks because I want to get through them so we leave time for questions and comments uh, from you, what you're interested in. But I'm going to start on November 30th, 1835, when Halley's Comet graced the sky above the small town of Florida, Missouri, and Samuel Langhorne Clemens was born prematurely, a sickly child whose parents doubted he would survive. Sam once asked his mother, were you afraid I wouldn't survive? She replied, no, I was afraid you would. Many years later, the famed author, humorist, lecturer, and public commentator, Mark Twain, predicted 
that these two unaccountable freaks of nature who come in together must go out together. And sure enough, when Halley's Comet returned on its 75-year cycle, Mark Twain died on April 21, 1910. And by the time of his death, he had become America's first global celebrity. Robed in a white suit, white cravat and shoes, crowned with unruly white hair and smoking an ever-present cigar, he was an astute observer and much sought after commentator of American politics. And his insightful commentary retains an uncanny relevance to the challenges facing contemporary America. His views are as fresh and provocative as any contemporary cable TV talking head, Sunday morning roundtable, political blogger, or radio talk show host. As Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. How, does, how did Clemens' interest in politics begin? Sam dropped out of school at age 11 after his father, who had been active in local Whig politics and unsuccessful in business, suddenly died. The only thing his father left the family was 75,000 acres of undeveloped Tennessee land, which on his deathbed he promised would one day make them rich. It never did. Sam tried several unsatisfying jobs in a grocery store, apothecary, blacksmith shop, and bookstore. He, he even studied law, but gave it up because it was so prosy and tiresome, he said. Then Sam went to work as a printer's devil, setting type in his brother Orion's newspaper shop in Hannibal, Missouri, what Ben Franklin has called a poor boy's college education. While the rote learning of his school days had sparked truancy, Sam's practical work in the newspaper office sparked curiosity. In the mid-19th century, there were thousands of newspapers fueling the appetite of an increasingly literate public, and they were intensely partisan with editors active in political parties. They were a primary source of entertainment, offering community information, opinion, humor, gossip, and literary filler. Exposed to classic literature, Sam became a voracious reader. He once said, a person who won't read has no advantage over a person who can't read. In Missouri, a slave state, the newspapers reported how the abolitionists in Illinois across the river refused to comply with the fugitive slave law that compelled the return of runaway slaves. Sam grew up playing with slave children and learned to love storytelling from old Uncle Dan. Oh, Uncle Dan. But he had also learned from the politicians, the teachers, and the preachers that slavery was divinely ordained, and he detested those infernal abolitionists. The internal conflict between his personal friendships and what he was taught churned within him. His resolution is expressed poetically in Huckleberry Finn when Hux decides that loyalty to his friend, the escaping slave Jim, trumps the dictates of law and religion. Remember, the Dred Scott case was the law of the land in those days. The teenager Sam was soon contributing comical sketches and news reporting from the comfortable Whig perspective, targeting Democratic opponents and incompetent officials. Sam wrote a regular column making fun of everything from corruption in the Missouri legislature to the British monarchy. Clemens had a lifelong aversion to monarchy and all forms of autocracy. He was a passionate believer in representative democracy despite its many failings. To his mother's chagrin, Sam wrote that the newly enacted whiskey tax had made it a patriotic duty to drink. In his first satire on meddlesome government, on a meddlesome uh, government regulation of business, the 15-year-old wrote, ridiculing a municipal ordinance that forced farmers to sell their eggs in the local market, a most extraordinary ordinance, he said, mocking the legislation. A lifelong skeptic of bureaucracy, many years later he wrote, the departmental interpreters of the laws in Washington can always be depended upon to take any reasonably good law and interpret the common sense out of it. At 17, Sam Clemens grew restless. He set off on a journey to visit the great cities of the East Coast and made a, what he called a flying trip to the nation's capital. From the visitor's gallery, he watched the senators debate the extension of slavery into the territories. He was not impressed. He wrote his family for publication in his brother's newspaper. The Senate is now composed of a different material from what it was. 
its glory hath departed. Its halls no longer echo the words of a Clay or Webster or Calhoun. They have played their parts and retired from the stage. And though they are still occupied by others, the void is felt. And he moved over to watch the house in action. And he said, they seem to be a mob of empty-headed whippersnappers that had only come to Congress to make incessant motions, propose eternal amendments, and rise to everlasting points of order. Although he would have many close friends in Congress through the years, his respect for the institution did not improve, and his assault on the body could sometimes be brutal. Suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you're a member of Congress, but I repeat myself. <laughs> a congressman is the trivialist distinction for a full-grown man. A flea can be taught anything a congressman can. The chameleon wheels one eye ear rearwards and the other forwards, which gives him a most congressional expression, one eye on the constituency and the other on the swag. His writings are replete with such derision of Congress. We could take all night quoting Mark Twain on Congress. In 1857, he pursued his dream to become a Mississippi River pilot. A pilot in those days, he said, was only unfettered and entirely independent human being that lived on the face of the earth. If it had not been for the Civil War, a cannonball that burst the smokestack of the riverboat in Nebraska, and a Union blockade at Memphis, Clemens might never have become an author. He took his nom de plume from the river. Mark Twain is the second mark on the line lowered from a boat into the water to check its depth, indicating 12 feet, which means the muddy waters are safe to navigate. When war broke out, Clemens joined his boyhood pals in a bedraggled outfit called the Marion Rangers to defend the state capital against a Union invasion. When the retreating Union reached its birthplace of Florida, Missouri, with Colonel Ulysses S. Grant in hot pursuit, Clemens deserted. He explained he was incapacitated by fatigue from persistent retreating. Clemens documented his two weeks of Civil War experience in an 1885 short story, The Private History of a Campaign That Failed. What starts out as a burlesque satire shifts subtly into an anguished moral epitome of war. That all war must be just that, the killing of strangers against whom you feel no personal animosity, Strangers whom in other circumstances you would help if you found them in trouble, and who would help you if you needed it. His early experience with war foreshadowed his later vehement opposition to American military aggression abroad. Twain was not a pacifist. He thought war was justified in the nation's defense, or to overthrow an autocratic regime like Tsarist Russia or colonialist Spain, but he vigorously opposed imperialistic expansion and the occupation of foreign lands for any purpose whether to exploit natural resources, to Christianize the heathen, or to impose American-style democracy. Sam avoided the rest of the Civil War when his brother Orion, who had campaigned for Lincoln on the new Republican ticket, was appointed secretary to the new Nevada territories. Sam accompanied him to Carson City and eventually became a reporter for the respected Virginia City Territorial Enterprise, covering the territorial legislature. Through parody, Twain expressed his unvarnished opinion of the legislatures. Small minds and selfish souls, they were for sale or rent on the mild, mildest possible terms. He claimed the legislatures doled out so many toll roll franchises as political favors that there wasn't enough land in Nevada to build them all. Among dozens of satires, he wrote the story of the bad little boy who grew up to become wealthy by all manner of cheating and rascality, and now he is the infernalist, wickedest scoundrel in his native village and is universally respected and belongs to the legislature. After a flurry of nasty competing editorials, Clemens challenged a rival to a duel but fled Nevada to San Francisco before the bullets started flying. He became a reporter for the morning call, and then witnessing the stoning of a Chinaman by some hooligans, he wrote an expose of rampant anti-Chinese racism. When the editor refused to publish the article for fear of offending his mostly Irish readers, Sam exploded and he was fired. He continued his writing for other periodicals and focused on corruption, particularly in the San Francisco Police Department. He wrote a widely acclaimed short story about a jumping frog and launched his career as a popular lecturer. 
He was engaged by the San Francisco Alta as a traveling correspondent and headed east where he joined the Quaker City steamship tour of Europe and the Holy Lands. And upon his return to the States, he headed to Washington, D.C. in November 1867 to begin a job as legislative clerk to Senator William Stewart of Nevada. Did you know that? Sam Clements was a legislative a Senate aide. In the Civil War's aftermath, the nation was polarized. Abraham Lincoln's voice of reconciliation had been tragically silenced. And his hard-drinking, tenured successor, Tennessee Democrat Andrew Johnson, was doing battle with the radical Republicans in Congress over how to bring the South back into the Union and the freed slaves into the mainstream of America. The federal government had grown in size and importance during the war. And so 32-year-old Sam met with the representatives of the railroads, Wall Street, mining, agriculture, and manufacturing who flooded the corridors of power seeking special favors. Contrary to the conventional wisdom, entrepreneurs those days did not compete solely in unregulated free markets. They competed in Congress. Congress picked winners and losers, and money co-opted the legislative process. That his Senate boss chaired the Pacific Railroad Committee while on the dole of the Central Pacific Railroad was simply the way Washington did business. With hindsight, Twain's often quoted comment, it could probably be shown by facts and figures that there's no distinctly um, native American criminal class, except Congress, that th this was not such a stretch given the pervasive practices of the bribery, vote buying, and passing legislation that enriched its sponsors. I'm a moralist in disguise, he said. It gets me into a heap of trouble when I go thrashing around in political questions. Within two months, Senator Stewart fired his young legislative aide, and Sam moved over to Newspaper Row on Pennsylvania Avenue to report on Reconstruction legislation and Congress's attempt to impeach the president. His satires about Congress and the federal bureaucracy still ring true. He mocked government junkets abroad, lengthy government reports that no one would read, the platitudinous re rhetoric of congressmen and the lobbyists who wrote their speeches, partisan bickering, parliamentary gamesmanship like filibusters, meaningless roll calls and votes, and incessant motions, and the lack of accountability in a sprawling federal bureaucracy. To cite but, but, but one example, Twain mocked an actual colloquy in the Congressional Globe, pre predecessor to today's record. Illinois congressman and war hero, Black Jack Logan complained that two congressmen had given exactly the same speech on the House floor a few days apart, written by a lobbyist. Only two. The New York Times reported in 2009 that during the House debate on health care reform, 22 Republicans and 20 Democrats used the same speech, written by a Washington lobbyist for a biotechnology firm. The Twain tradition of satirizing Congress and politicians continues to this day in the likes of John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, Second City, Capitol Steps, and many, many others. Well, two important events occurred in Sam Clemens' life while he was living in Washington. First, he met the love of his life and wife-to-be, Libby. And after 184 letters of courtship, he married into the wealthy, progressive, Republican Langdon family of Elmira, New York. The son of a slave owner married the daughter of an abolitionist, whose work on the Underground Railroad helped secure the freedom of a Baltimore slave named Frederick Douglass. And second, Clemens received a letter from my great-grandfather, Elisha Bliss, inviting him to write a book about his travels on the Quaker City tour. Traveling to Hartford, he negotiated the contract for The Innocents Abroad, which was the best-selling book during his lifetime. But frustrated with life in the Capitol and eager to begin his career as an author, Clemens left Washington in March 1868, taking with him a gold mine of anecdotes that would fuel his writing for many years to come. After a stint as editor of the Buffalo Express, he moved to Hartford, built his incredible home in Nook Farm next to Harriet Beecher Stowe, and concentrated on his writing, lecturing, and to his family's lasting regret, investments in printing technology. In Hartford, one snowy evening in 1872, Charles Dudley Warner, a journalist and author, and his wife Susan dined with Sam and Libby. During the after-dinner banner, Warner and Clemens chided their wives about the lightweight novels they were reading. The woman retorted with a challenge. 
If you think the books we are reading are so bad, why don't you write a better one? Warner and Clemens looked at each other and decided to accept the challenge and write their first novel as partners. In January, Clemens began the book with a vengeance, writing the first 11 chapters in a few weeks, drawing on his experience with his mother's Missouri cousin, James Lampton, an inveterate schemer, dreamer, and promoter who would become Colonel Sellers in the book. Clemens spun an autobiographical yarn about it, the roots in rural America. Then, on the morning of January 31st, 1873, Clemens picked up the New York Tribune and the headlines screamed out, the self-righteous, overtly pious, Senator Samuel Pomeroy of Kansas, who Clemens had detested when he was a Senate staffer, had paid $7,000 in cash to a Kansas state legislator to support his bid for re-election for a third term. The state senator promptly carried the cash into the Capitol, denouncing Pomeroy for bribery. This was the Washington Clemens remembered. After the sacrifice of the Civil War, the epoch of greed had arrived. The economy was booming and as Wall Street financiers, corporate monopolists amassed enormous wealth and the working classes struggled under oppressive conditions. The gap between the rich and the poor widened to an unprecedented degree and the rich infiltrated the political process. The Grant, Grant administration scandals lit up the press, the backroom legislation the deals, the powerful lobbies, the bribery and vote buying, the special interest legislation. It was called the Great Barbecue. It was an age of riches set on a rotten social fabric like gilt, like gilt paint on rot rotten wood. The title of the novel that the authors chose, The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, named the era it describes. Clemens would now tap his gold mine. The story moves to Washington as Colonel Sellers and a beautiful female lobbyist, Laura, conspire with Senator Dilworthy, who was actually Senator Pomeroy, to pass an appropriations bill to purchase 75,000 acres of Tennessee land at an inflated price to build the Knobs Industrial University to educate freed slaves. As Senator Dilworthy explains to Laura, I never push a private interest if it's not justified and ennobled by some larger public good. Sellers greatly admires the senator, pointing out that he's been in the Senate only a couple of years and he's already a millionaire. Twain demonstrates his mastery of legislative procedure and lobbying technique. He details the effort to secure passage of the appropriations earmark through vote buying, speech writing, parliamentary maneuvers, and manipulation of the press. In the end, though, the senator and Laura fail because they're caught up in scandals. Dilworthy's re-election bribe is exposed and Laura murders an unsavory seducer with whom she has fallen in love. Her murder trial becomes a major media attraction and she's acquitted by a jury on grounds of temporary insanity. Jury trials were another uh, topic that Twain frequently satirized. Like thunderstorms, Washington scandals intermittently recur, upsetting the natural order, as Twain said, rising, like, rising up like a miasmatic ex exaltation from the Potomac. How often do we read today about fallen angels who press to incorporate their moral convictions into legislation only to be exposed in uncompromising situations, in compromising situations? The provocative tale about Americans' obsession with getting rich, greed and speculation in the financial markets, and the influence of money and lobbyists in Congress remains a tale of today. Contemporary commentators are beginning to draw parallels between our age and the Gilded Age. Despite numerous regulatory restrictions and campaign finance reforms, there are more than 13,000 registered lobbyists and many more unregistered, unregistered strategic advisors and historians, uh, many of whom are former members of Congress and their aides, raising millions of dollars in campaign funds and drafting legislation and floor speeches. Since the start of 2009, when Congress began considering Dodd-Frank legislation to regulate financial institutions and avoid another 2008 near collapse, more than 1,400, uh, that's right, 1,400 former members of Congress, Capitol Hill staffers, or federal executive branch employees registered as lobbyists on behalf of financial services industries. 73 of them were former members of Congress. Now, the original Social Security Act is 28 pages long. The Dodd-Frank bill is 2,319 pages. Can anyone guess why? The problem is not lobbying per se. As Congress becomes increasingly involved in 
complex sectors of the economy, lobbyists perform an essential role in the legislative process, helping shape more effective laws and avoiding unintended consequences. Mark Twain himself was a frequent and effective lobbyist for copyright reform. The problem is that many lobbyists have become major fundraisers. To illustrate, in 2009, the Washington Post obtained a leaked memo from the House Ethics Committee. A K Street lobbying firm had raised more than $6.2 million in campaign contributions for the re-election of seven congressmen in mostly safe seats. And the congressman allegedly steered $200 million in earmarked defense contracts to the clients of the lobbying firm. The lobbyists received $114 million in fees for their efforts. The Ethics Committee rushed out a report after the Post exposed its, the memo, exonerating the congressman and pointing out that each of the transactions were legal and any connection between them is mere speculation. The issue in the Gilded Age and today boils down to money and politics. What do convicted lobbyists Jack Abramoff and former Congressman, now Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, agree upon? Quote from each of them, we have a system of legalized bribery, unquote. Another example, there's been a recent focus on congressional insider trading since a 60-minute expose. Yet studies have shown that between 1985 and 2006, congressional investment portfolios outperformed the market by 55%, a record any hedge fund manager would envy. Since the Citizen United Supreme Court decision, we have seen the impact of super PACs on the election process. The cost of election campaigns has skyrocketed. Members of Congress running for re-election in the now perpetual campaign spend up to 70% of their time fundraising, diverting them from the legislative business, which has delegated the staff and lobbyists. And negative advertising has become e epidemic. Now, I'm borrowing this from uh, what I heard in one of the talk shows the other night, but if United Airlines read it, ran ads graphically showing that if you flew Delta or American Airlines, you would die in a fiery crash, how many of you would continue to fly any airline? <laughs> and yet, uh, is it any wonder the public has grown increasingly skeptical of government and that Congress's approval rate hovers at about 11% on a good day? Twain was highly critical of negative campaigning and wrote several satires on the subject. In running for governor, he runs as a squeaky clean candidate, but the press ignores his responses to scurrilous fabricated attacks on him and is forced to withdraw from the race as a fatally damaged person. In another satire, before running for office, Twain decides to disclose all the terrible things he has done in his life so his political opponents would have nothing to expose. Well before the internet, Twain remarked, a lie can travel halfway around the globe before the truth can get its shoes on. As Twain wrote, it cannot be well or safe to let the present political conditions continue indefinitely. They can be improved. And American citizenship should rouse up from its disheartenment and see that it is done. Yes, some progress has been made. The administration has placed additional restrictions on lobbying. Congress is addressing insider trading, filibuster abuse, and the constipated confirmation process. It has placed a two-year moratorium on earmarks. But what about the more than trillion dollars in tax expenditures each year, an amount almost equal to total tax revenues, Many of these are temporary tax loopholes, which are routinely renewed after a lobbying onslaught every few years. Much more needs to be done to break the bond between fundraising and lobbying. Twain's Gilded Age has many parallels to the last 25 years. Boom and bust economic cycles, rapid technological and cultural change, laissez-faire government policy, financial speculation, global integration, the influence of money in politics, rising income disparity, polarized political parties, stalemated government, and US military intervention in faraway lands. When Haley's Comet returned in 1985, history began repeating itself. We had a series of crises, leveraged buyouts, savings and loans crisis, the dot-com bubble, a plague of corporate scandals, bankruptcies, risky investment vehicles that almost brought down Wall Street. Income disparity now has reached levels not seen in 80 years. Today, the wealthiest 1% of families earn as much each year as the bottom 60%, and they possess as much wealth as the bottom 90%. In contrast, the 2010 census brought bad news. 
since peaking in 1999, median family income has declined 7%. The typical male worker's income is less today than it was in 1978. One in six Americans lives in poverty, 46.2. Unemployment remains high, and home foreclosures have soared. In the Gilded Age, U.S. corporations imported Chinese and Irish labor, but today, U.S.-based global corporations move capital and job overseas to emerging markets with lower wages and taxes. From 1999 through 2008, they shrunk the domestic workforces by 1.9 million, jo million jobs, while increasing employment overseas by 2.4 million. Speaking about the Gilded Age, Pulitzer Prize-winning political historian Gary Wills wrote in the New York Times in 1976, quote, Mark Twain has been gone a hundred years, but his political wisdom endures. As a history lesson, The Gilded Age is our best political novel, which grows with every reading. Now, not too many people would actually agree with that, but um, Twain learned early on that speaking truth to power, when you're speaking truth to power, the medicine goes down a lot easier with a dose of humor. History has tried hard to teach us that we can't have good government under politicians, he quipped. Now to go and stick one at the head of government couldn't be wise. He was an early master of the soundbite, but beneath the surface of a pithy atherism was a fundamental irony. The talent and tactics it takes to campaign for public office are not necessarily the skills it takes to govern effectively. Over the course of, of his career, Twain did a 180 degree turn on some issues like racial discrimination, women's suffrage, the death penalty, and free trade. On other issues, he was always consistent advocating the separation of church and state and the repeal of tax exemptions for religious institutions and the repeal of blue laws. He was a passionate advocate of civic, civic education, which should be taught on a mother's knee and at every level of education. He even favored giving educated voters greater weight in elections. He feared the ignorant masses would elect corrupt politicians like Tammany Hall's boss Tweed. And he was credited with helping elected reform mayor of New York City in 1901, Seth Lowe, and throwing Tammany Hall out of office. Twain feared the American experiment would fail unless educated and informed voters elected competent representatives who put the public interest ahead of personal ambition and who led with courage and independence instead of reciting threadbare platitudes and give me liberty or give me death bunkum, as he put it. Elected leaders should simply should not simply put their finger to the wind and gauge the shifting breezes of public opinion. He mockingly wrote of such politicians, its name is public opinion, it's held in reverence, it settles everything, some think it's the voice of God. Twain was consistently skeptical of bureaucracies, legislatures, and the expanding power of the federal government. He wrote, there's a great danger that our people will lose our independence of thought and action which is the cause of much of our greatness, and sink into the helplessness of the Frenchman or the German who expects his government to feed him when hungry, clothe him when naked, to prescribe when his child may be born and when he may die, and in fine, to regulate every act of humanity from cradle to the tomb. This sounds a little bit like uh, Romney or Ron Paul, I guess. In satires like the Great V Contract, he mocked the inefficiency and the redundancy and aloofness of incompetent patronage employees of the federal government. He consistently campaigned for civil service reform to replace the spoils system. He fought for hiring, retention, and promotion of federal employees solely on merit, experience, expertise, and most of all, performance. Twain, Twain claimed he never joined any political party or church, but he mostly voted Republican until 1884. In those days, the it was the Democrats who advocated lower taxes, less government, and states' rights. And Twain campaigned, for example, for Rutherford B. Hayes and admired his promise to serve only one term on the grounds that he could not serve all the people and run for re-election at the same time. In these days of the perpetual campaign, is it time to reconsider Hayes' proposal for a single six-year presidential term? But in 1884, the Republicans nominated James Blaine whom Twain thought was corrupt. And he decided to join the Mugwumps, precursors of today's independence. Twain and the Mugwumps pledged to vote for the best candidate of either party. He supported Grover Cleveland, who fought Tammany Hall as governor of New York and had a reputation for integrity and efficient government. Cleveland vetoed hundreds of special interest bills more than any other president. 
and took on wasteful defense contractors and railroads. Eschewing political parties, the mature twain campaigned for and against candidates based on their character and record of integrity. I simply want to see the right man at the helm, and in those days it was the right man. <laughs> in fact, it still is, if we talk about the presidency, I guess. He said, I don't care what his party creed is. Twain grew tired of partisan trench warfare and condemned elected representatives who put loyalty to party above loyalty to country. He once wrote, if the Democrats put the multiplication table in their platform, the Republicans would campaign against it. If that sounds like uh, President Obama talking about the debt ceiling crisis to me. Twain thought the selection of candidates through the party primary process was a disaster because the majority of the electorate sit complacently at home and then they complain when they're faced with the choice of two mediocre candidates chosen by political activists. In 1898, the ship Maine blew up off the coast of Cuba. Was it a boiler mal malfunction, as the Navy found, or an attack by Spain, as hyped up by the yellow press? When America went to war to free the Cubans from Spanish rule, at first Twain thought this was a noble cause, helping oppressed people overthrow colonial domination. But when he saw the Treaty of Paris provided for the U.S. occupation of the Philippines, he turned virulently against it, becoming a public spokesman for the anti-imperialist movement. He became a defender of suppressed peoples throughout the world, advocating the violent overthrow of the Russian Tsar, exposing the atrocities of King Leopold's brutal regime of the Congo, defending the Chinese in the Boxer Rebellion, and condemning the Boer War in South Africa. But it was his attacks on the American occupation of the Philippines were the most poignant. He wrote about one of the most horrific massacres in American history in 1906 when the U.S. military led by War hero General Leonard Wood circled the rim on the crater of an extinct volcano, Mount Dahu, as 540 U.S. soldiers and their Philippine colleagues mowed down 600 Muslim men, women, and children 50 feet below. Twain's writings condemned the false patriotism that rallied American support for unjust wars and military aggression, which earned him the antipathy of President Theodore Roosevelt. In such works as The War Prayer, A Person Sitting in Darkness, The Mysterious Stranger, and King Leopold's Soliloquy, he makes the case against foreign domination and occupation of underdeveloped countries. Twain advocated increasing the pay and, and responsibilities of diplomats in the use of international arbitration to resolve international disputes. So in sum, as he grew in public stature, Mark Twain became a sought-after commentator on political and policy matters. He warned against the dangers of party politics that put winning elections above the public interest, polarized the nation, and substituted partisan gamesmanship for advancing the general good. He bitterly attacked America's imperialistic engagement in unjust wars and occupation of foreign lands. He strongly advocated social and racial justice, but he mistrusted Congress and the federal bureaucracy's ability to bring about change. And much of what he said remains relevant today, and it's worthy of our listening to that voice of Mark Twain once again. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to, and I'm happy to invite questions or comments. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to invite questions uh, or comments. There are microphones on either side of the aisle uh, that we'd like you to use. It makes it much easier for everyone to hear you. Uh, in addition to that, um, Roberta, is Roberta here? Uh, uh, maybe, oh, she's there. Roberta has uh, little um, red tickets that she's going to be giving to each of the people who asks a question. And we have some Mark Twain memorabilia. Uh, we'll have a little raffle. Um, and so two of the speakers, or two of the people who ask questions, will receive some Mark Twain memorabilia, some paintings and some wonderful US uh, postage stamps with Mark Twain on them. Uh, one more housekeeping thing, and that is I just wanted to mention at the end, if you need a certificate of attendance uh, for any reason for your class, Roberta will be giving them out at the end at the top of the stairs. Thank you so much, and uh, I know that Don is going to welcome um, some questions. Do you think Twain used his books to convey his political beliefs? To, to what? His political beliefs? 
to convey his political beliefs? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the uh, uh, I mean, Mark Twain was more a moralist than an author. I think he 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 really wanted to uh, leave his readers with a message, and. Uh, I take for Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Uh, it really deals with the issues of, of uh, monarchy, an established church, the importance of separation of church and state. I mean, a lot of these themes come through. Certainly, Huckleberry Finn and Puddinghead Wilson deal with issues of race, and uh, so he definitely wanted his re to leave a message with his readers uh, on, uh, and that was more important to him, I think, than than. Uh, than the structure of the book and the story he was telling. But he did say that sometimes the best way to, to, to leave a message with someone is through telling a story. If you, if you give a speech like I did tonight, you walk out and say, what did he say? I can't, you know. But if you tell a story, he, Mark Twain said, people will remember that. It will resonate with them. Um, and so he liked to deliver his, his message through storytelling. And he learned that from Uncle Daniel, uh, who was a slave on his uncle John Corll's farm. And uh, they used to sit. Uh, at his feet and along with the slave children and listen to stories passed down from generation to generation. And Uncle Daniel was actually the character Jim in, in Huckleberry Finn. So uh, storytelling was the way he delivered his message. That's, at least that's my view. Others may disagree. Hi. Uh, by the time he died, he was very dark. Um, he, he had uh, experienced death in the family, close uh, family members, I believe. Um, and uh, his writings were far removed from the early stuff. And uh, the same goes, I think, if you listen to the comedy of George Carlin, who you could say had some of Twain in him. Are you, first off, could you address, uh, number one, some of his later writings and, and, and the darkness and, and, and how it manifested itself? And number two, are you worried for John Stewart and Stephen Colbert that they might be driven to madness by this pursuit? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to worry about, I think John Stewart and Stephen Colbert are doing well, although I've, I'm told many younger people that's their only source of news, and I think you probably should have other sources as well. <laughs> you know, um, I didn't get into this, but Twain led a very tragic life in many ways. I mean, his, um, he lost uh, uh, three of his siblings uh, under circumstances where he felt some personal responsibility, all of which was unjustified. But his brother Henry, for example, he got him a job on a steamboat, and then there was an explosion. And, and Sam Clemens said he had a dream that he saw Henry in a, in a metal casket wearing Sam's clothes with a, 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 a yellow, a red roses with a yellow rose in the center, and uh, that's exactly what happened. So, I mean, and then and as an adult, he lost uh, three of his, his son. Well, he took him out, his young son took him out for, at 18 months for a stroll, kind of lost track of things, and uh, the son caught a cold and then died at 18 of, of diphtheria. It had nothing to do with catching a cold, but he always said that it was his fault that his son died, so he always carried that burden. He had two daughter, three daughters, two of whom he, uh, Susie was, uh, he adored. She died uh, uh, meningitis while he was on, in London trying to pay off his debts on a world tour uh, because he had gone bankrupt through really bad investments, another part of it, tragedy. And then, uh, um, on, on, on Christmas Eve, he was finally reconciled with his youngest daughter, Jean, and uh, they were together in his home in Stormfield, and she drowned in the bathtub after an, um, uh, a seizure. So, uh, and then his wife, his, they had the most wonderful marriage, Livy and Sam, and she, she died. She was never really in great health, and, and then she died uh, in Italy. So he lost his wife, uh, uh, three of his four children. Uh, he grew up where his mother kind of Get inculcated the sense of guilt for some of the death of his siblings, and so and then he went through bankruptcy. Uh, so it was a pretty tragic life. And and at the end of his life, toward the end of his life, he did develop a very dark philosophy. It was really a deterministic philosophy, uh, and uh, stories like the mysterious. Some of the stories like the mysterious stranger were not published uh, until long after his death. A lot of it was suppressed by his one living survivor, uh, Clara, and. Uh, his uh, 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 biographer and literary executor, Alfred Bigelow Payne, because they didn't want the world to know the, uh, the dark side of, of Mark Twain. As Twain once said, uh, like the moon, uh, every man has a dark side he shows to no one. And his uh, literary executor tried to prevent the world from seeing that. But when, when they all died, the California Bancroft Library at Berkeley took over his papers and opened it up to scholars. And there's still 
finding material that's not been published. As you, as you probably know, volume one of his huge autobiography uh, was published in October of last year. And uh, volume two is supposed to come out in 2013, I think. And uh, a lot of this has been published in other forms, but some of this was, is, it's, it's uh, a lot of very, very vitriolic attacks on uh, people, including my great-grandfather. He says terrible things about my great-grandfather. And uh, Theodore, Ro Theodore Roosevelt and others. Um, and and um, a very determinist philosophy that, the, that, that what is man, one of his, or, and then he wrote these series of articles about Adam and Eve, the diary of Adam and Eve, and, and they basically, uh, you know, that people have no control over their lives. They're basically the victims of, of heredity and the environment, and uh, uh, there is no free will. Although, you know, he always made exceptions to this philosophy. I mean, he couldn't really stick to it. Um, and then, you know, his political writings, uh, uh, he devoted himself after the turn of the century to this anti-imperialism movement. It became the War Prayer is just a, a, a wonderful essay on uh, uh, how people, through false patriotism, rally to support a war, even though there are a few people at the beginning they realize it's really not either necessary or right, but how they gradually rally to it. And uh, uh, so. Uh, so his writing, and as an older man, some of it was suppressed, some of it was very deterministic, and, and others were, were uh, really uh, established uh, uh, a contrary view of American imperialism and false patriotism. How does the... Uh, Sorry. Who's next? Over here? here? Over here? Okay. How does the historical time period influence... I'm sorry, I can't hear how does the in, um, historical time period influence Twain's writing? The historical time period? Mm -hmm. How did it influence him? Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I, he, he grew up in a slave state. Uh, he uh, lived through the, a period of enormous change in American history. Uh, he, uh, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, he pretty much avoided the Civil War. He wasn't really willing to take a side at that point. He was, in many ways, a Southerner who became uh, married into a northern uh, progressive family and, and uh, his views on issues like, uh, like slavery were completely um, changed over the course of his life. In fact, uh, um, he uh, uh, provided scholarships for a number of African American students, including one lawyer who he paid his tuition to go through Yale Law School. And that lawyer set up a practice in Baltimore where Thurgood Marshall was an apprentice. So he, uh, um, he was very much, uh, uh, you know, lived through a very interesting period in American history and it very much influenced his views and, and his views changed on, on many issues because of that. Um, what were Mark Twain's major accomplishment in the case of slavery those days? In case of what? Slavery. Slavery? Yeah. Well, um, I think that uh, it's interesting that, uh, uh, you know, he worked uh, during that short time that he was working in Congress, he was working for the Republicans. Now, remember, the Republicans were the one, ones who were fighting for the 15th Amendment. In fact, Senator William Stewart, who he didn't get along with too well, was actually the drafter of the 15th Amendment, which abolished slavery. And Twain never really gave him much credit for that. He, he, was, he was more interested in writing about the corruption in Congress than he was about the good things that Congress did. And they did a lot of good things during that time. The first Civil Rights Acts, uh, the, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and, uh, but Twain didn't acknowledge much at that point. Now, later in his life, um, he became a very uh, strong uh, supporter of, of civil rights. And as I said, he, uh, he helped with the education of a number of, uh, of African Americans. But, uh, uh, even Huckleberry Finn, which is written in, in eight, I don't know, around 1886 or something, it was a look back on slavery. It wasn't written at the time. So at the time, uh, his views were that of a Southerner, and, and they changed. So uh, when he, his books on, uh, on uh, in Huckleberry Finn, for example, is, is a flashback to a period, but it is not, doesn't reflect his thinking at the time at, of that period. Thank you. My question is, um, what was Mark Twain's view on like women rights? Um, I know that uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton like had her independence of declaration for women's right, 
and there was a lot of women movement going on at that time period. So I would like to know what his view was that and if he um, believed in it. And I also wanted to know was um, um, his relationship with Helen Killer because I read about Helen Killer and there was um, a bond with them or something. Um, yeah. And wh what was the second part of the question? Like Helen Killer, Keller. Oh, Helen Keller. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, like good. Their relationship. Yeah. Well, first of all, Mark, um, as, as a young writer, he was he made a lot of fun of women's suffrage and women's rights, and he wrote some some satires uh, pointing out that uh, you know if, if 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 women could run for public office, men would become nursemaids, and and and. Uh, uh, cousin Jenny wrote him and said, "You've got to stop satirizing this. This is a serious issue." So, but um, when he moved to Nook Farm in Hartford, one of his, his neighbors was um, Isabella Hooker, uh, who was a very uh, strong um, women's rights advocate, women's suffrage advocate, and, and uh, he was persuaded to become a very strong advocate for women's suffrage. In fact, he went completely to the opposite extent. He gave talks advocating. Uh, the women's right to vote. He said, how can we have a real democracy if, uh, if women can't vote? How can we, uh, if women could vote, it would change, it would reform our government. We wouldn't have all these scandals and everything because women would, would, but this was, you know, a after he had completely uh, uh, changed his view. As a young man, he'd written that uh, if women could vote, um, they would just do what men do. Uh, and that, that her, their real place is in the home and they shouldn't be out politicking. It's unseen. Politics is unseemly and, and it's, it's below the dignity of women to be in politics. That's what he wrote as a young man. As, an, as a mature advocate for women's suffrage, he's, he strongly supported uh, uh, the women's vote. He, and he, uh, he said that it, it would transform our democracy if women had the right to vote. And how can we claim to be a democracy if half of our people are denied the franchise? So he, he uh, completely changed, as he did in, 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 in the issue of free trade and protectionism, as he did in the death penalty, as he did in the issue of, of, of slavery over the course of his life on that issue. He, he was uh, um, a uh, friend of Helen Keller's. They, they were mutual admirers. Um, and um, when he ran into financial trouble, Henry Hiddleston Rogers, who was a vice president of Standard Oil, helped him with his finances, and, and Rogers really was the one who paid for uh, all of Helen Keller's education and support, um, and so, so the, the, they were very close, and I remember when, when Twain gave a speech uh, after the Philippines fiasco um, that Helen Keller was in the audience at Princeton and, and, and remarked, uh, it, it, Twain said at one point, you know, there's a law that says if, if I criticize American occupation of the Philippines, uh, that I'm a traitor. And he said, well, I'm proud to be a traitor. And Helen Keller was in that audience when he made that comment and, and remarked on it. So yes, they were, they were good, uh, good friends. Who's next? More? You had mentioned yes. that he wasn't necessarily anti-war. Was he ever criticized for not being active in, uh, in, during the Civil War? You said he had deserted after a week and a half. Yeah, right. Uh, but, uh, throughout his career, had anybody ever really criticized him or brought, brought to point his inactivity? Well, I, yeah, I imagine they did. You know, I mean, the thing that's sort of interesting about him is that uh, among his closest friends were the generals. General Grant, you know, he, he published General Grant's uh, personal memoirs and was very close to him as General Grant was dying of throat cancer and really revered General Grant, who was terrible president, I guess, but, but he revered him as, as a great war hero. And uh, Grant uh, had great respect for Mark Twain as well. So um, I think for the most part, nobody really held that against him. But I'm sure there were, I think there was, there, there was one instance where people said, well, how can you be criticizing American, uh, mili American military when you evaded the military yourself? It, that, that was one of the responses that people uh, as they reacted to his anti-imperialism campaign and his criticism of American occupation in the Philippines. Well, you know, you were a draft evader. Why should we listen to you? You're, you're, you're a traitor. You're not loyal to the country. Uh, Hi. My question goes to uh, historical time periods and personalities. So when I look at somebody like Benjamin Franklin, let's say, before the Industrial Era really kicked in the United States, he had more of an entrepreneurial spirit. He had more of a, you know, you could buy land, you could sell land, you could, 
you know, land was free. There was no bureaucratic structure. And I get the sense that he had more of a, you know, sort of a interesting personality, as, as people of the time probably did. But I get the sense that by the time Mark Twain came along, he was sort of uh, upset with the bureaucracy and didn't like being pigeonholed into a position somewhere and not being able to express himself freely. What, do you think that impacted his views, et cetera, the historical period, in terms of the actual personalities of the individual? In this case, Mark Twain, let's say, versus Ben Franklin. Yeah, well, you know, Mark, Mark Twain, you know, matured during the Industrial Revolution into a, a period where uh, we had both a lot of um, corruption in business through monopolists and the monopolists and, and uh, uh, the growing gap of income disparity and so forth. And also we had enormous progress in invention. We had, you know, the telegraph, the telephone, the, the uh, uh, electric light, uh, all of uh, this. And, and Twain was really uh, fascinated by invention. And his, he, he thought that government should stay out of the economy, that but he, he was very critical of the abusive practices of monopolists. I mean, he wrote uh, open letters to Commodore Vanden, Vanderbilt that were just, have you ever done any, have you ever apologized for anything you've done in your life? Have you ever done one right thing in your entire life? I mean, he just, you know, criticized the robber barons, the, the tycoons of the industrial age. But at the same time, he greatly admired that Thomas Edison's and Nicholas Tesla, he was in his laboratory a lot. And Mark Twain thought of himself as an inventor. He had three patents. And uh, unfortunately, he lost all of his money through the, his investment in the page compositor, which was supposed to uh, mechanize the printing process. And, uh, but, but he really felt that the economy would thrive if we rewarded innovation, invention, and if we policed the abuse of, you know, corporate power and monopoly. Although he never really admired Ted, uh, Theodore Roosevelt as a trust buster, he never trusted him because he was a protectionist, and he thought protectionists and high tariffs were enabled the monopolists to, uh, you know, isolated them from 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 competition. So. Um, yeah, he was a product of his time, but it was a time of great invention and great change, great technological change. In fact, that's one of the similarities to today. Today we have the internet and all the amazing things that are going on in technology. In those days, you know, we had the Transcontinental Railroad that united the country in, in, as one commerce, uh, and then communications through the telegraph and then the telephone. And, and, and so there were enormous changes, and he had great admiration for that and thought the government should stay out of that. I hope that answers your question. Over here. Uh, my question is, how did Mark Twain's work uh, influence on society today? Today, Influence on what? Society. On what? Society. Society? Yes. And what's his influence on society today? Yes. Um, well, I think he's probably mostly remembered as a, and most of you study him in, in uh, literature classes, he's remembered as, a, you know, the first really American novelist, as uh, William Dean Howells, the editor of the Atlantic uh, said he's the Lincoln of our literature. Um, uh, before Mark Twain, I think most American writers were um, mimic, mimicking British style, and, and Mark Twain really spoke with the vernacular, and he, his ear was very attuned to different dialects and uh, very truthful. Uh, he was always interested in the facts. In the Gilded Age, it's more of a documentary because it's so thinly disguised as a recounting of all the scandals that occurred during the Grant administration, that just the names are changed. But uh, even the, the picture of Senator Dilworthy in, in the uh, novel is actually uh, uh, Senator Pomeroy, and everybody knew it. So um, his, uh, you know, his writing was really, and, and Ernest Hemingway said, all American literature comes from one source, Huckleberry Finn. And uh, so I think that's what he's mainly remembered for today. But my point, um, this evening is to try to point out that he was, he did a lot of other things too. He was America's first, first celebrity, global celebrity. He was just respected all over the world. And what he's, everybody wanted his comments and he had these pithy aphorisms or comments for every situation, which can be used for almost any purpose. I mean, you, the Tea Party can quote him and the, uh, uh, the libertarians can quote him and the liberals can quote him because, it, you know, it's hard to pin him down sometimes. But he's probably one of the most quoted, he along with Ben Franklin and, and uh, 
is one of the most quoted Americans for, for almost any purpose. And it's, it's hard to pin him down. First of all, he changed his views over, over the course of his life, but he tended, when he wrote a satire, one of his techniques was he would, um, he would take a position and then argue f for it in the most ridiculous and lurid reasoning. And women's suffrage is an example of that. He would, he would make fun of women's suffrage, but you weren't sure that that was actually his position. He never really revealed what his position was. It was satire, you know, and, and uh, humor. So he's remembered his impact today is, is the, um, his humor and his literature. And um, I, I'm, I'm trying to persuade you tonight that maybe his impact should also be on politics, that we ought to also look at, you know, the, some of the problems we're facing uh, today in, in our political system are not all that new. And uh, maybe we can learn a little bit from the history and what he had to say about it. If Mark Twain was alive today, how do you think he would feel about our government? Oh, come on, you society? can't. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, well, what did, what did President Obama say, you know, at the Alfalfa Club that, uh, you know, the Alfalfa Club is a Washington tradition that celebrates the birthday of Robert E. Lee, and it would have been Robert E. Lee's 200th birthday, and Obama said, I think if Robert E. Lee were here tonight, he'd be very confused. <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think if... Uh, Martin, Mark Twain were here tonight, he'd be very confused. I, I, I think he couldn't, even the most imaginative of American authors couldn't fathom a $15 trillion deficit, the size of our bureaucracy that we have, you know, what, uh, 60 programs uh, that deal with the homeless in some form or another, you know, the overlap, the duplication of the, this was a big theme of his, but the government was so small when he was dealing with it, but the great beef contract dealt with, you know, somebody going around trying to get a decision out of government and getting sent from one office to another and couldn't get any accountability. So I think Mark Twain would be appalled by all of that. Um, and, uh, but, but I think most anybody from that era would, would have a hard time. Uh, but, but I do think a lot of the things that, that, that he said about political parties, um, he would say, yeah, I was right. And, and I think he'd be, you know, as I mentioned earlier, he was a strong supporter of unions when he found out that 97% of U.S. workers now are not members of unions. I think that would be shocking to him. Um, so, yeah, it would be fun if he came back. He'd have a lot to say, I'm sure. All right, thanks. Uh, excuse me, do the novel of uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sire represent the life of Tom, uh, Mark Twain? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of his, uh, you know, the, one of the problems, he, he's written an autobiography and, and, you know, you never know what's true and what's fiction with Mark Twain, the, he, the line. But clearly, Tom Sawyer was his boyhood experience and, and Huck Finn was uh, uh, a boyhood friend of his and uh, Jim was Uncle Daniel from his uncle's farm. And a lot of it was, was autobiographical. Um, and uh, I think his life is sufficiently tragic that he kind of recreated in fiction a more idyllic childhood than he actually had. But sure, hit, those books were very much, I think, autobiographical, or at least they were the life he wished he'd had and, and remembered uh, in the best of times. Talking about the women rights, we're having a discussion right now at the Pentagon talking about the right of the women to go to the war, if they can be on the battlefield or something. What do you think would have been a uh, Michael Train idea or point of view according to that subject, to that matter? Uh, and about women, what about women's rights? Women. What? Oh, oh yeah, like uh, Mr. Santorum says, they just want them to go to bed. Oh, um, <laughs> I happen to, fight. I don't know. I mean, um, the, uh, um, when you take someone from that period of history, it would be very hard, I think, for uh, someone from that period of history to say that uh, that women should, uh, you know, go into battle. Um, and I, I can't think of anything he said one way or another on it, other than, you know, at toward the end of his life, he was such a strong advocate for equality that uh, uh, if that were an issue that uh, represented cutting edge policy today he probably would be on the cutting edge at the end of his life on that issue but uh, in those days I, you know I don't think it was something that anybody ever thought about my students of the American novel will be reading um, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn this week and um, I'm hoping by tomorrow or the next day they'll come upon the scene the episode where Huck and Jim 
are on the river and they come upon the, um, the wreck of the Sir Walter Scott. It's, the it's one of the many episodes in Huck Finn when, when Huck is concealing um, Jim from, from, from someone who might want to capture him and, and sell him back. And I think that you know, the, the choice of the name for that wreck, the Sir Walter Scott, is interesting because in, uh, in Life on the Mississippi, uh, Twain had written that the, the writings of Sir Walter Scott, of course those romantic tales of feudal England, they had, as mu in his idea, this sort of undemocratic I ideas, they had as much to do with forming the southern character and in turn had as much to do with, with why the Civil War was fought as anything that happened um, in this country. And so I'm, I'm, I wonder about the politics of this. So you have Mark Twain, who is a southerner. He had changed his views on so many things in his lifetime. He, he served for a week in the, in the southern army. Where, where is that, in the irony of, where is the meeting part between Mark Twain's views on really the southern character Slavery, but not only slavery, and, and sort of where he came out in the end in, in these novels. I'm curious what, what the politics of that you think. Right. Well, you know, I think you, you're really, uh, really on to something. He, he did think that Sir Walter Scott and his writings were what was wrong with the South. And, you know, he, 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 was, he was critical of Scott and James Fenimore Cooper and other writers in that particular English style. Um, there's a book. Uh, uh, out recently, in the last year or so, called The Reconstruction of Mark, Mark Twain that talks about his Southern heritage and how he changed. Uh, and I know that, I think it was the 92nd birthday of Abraham Lincoln or something at Carnegie Hall, he gave a speech and it was kind of, at first, uh, he did not vote for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he voted for Millard Fillmore of the American uh, Constitutional Party, be, which stood for keeping the Union together at all costs and compromising on slavery. His brother campaigned for Lincoln, but, but Mark Twain did not. But he grew to admire Lincoln like so many other Americans did. Um, and at, at this celebration in Carnegie Hall, he talked very personally about how he had changed. He said, you know, when we fought the Civil War, we thought we were fighting for our families and our traditions and our rights, and we lost, and we should have lost. And now we're all brothers and we're all one country, and that's the way it should be. And Abraham Lincoln is the greatest man, perhaps, with the exception of George Washington in our nation's history. So I think he, you know, over, you know, as he uh, matured and as he uh, assimilated into Northeastern progressive society, uh, you know, he, he shed his Southern roots. Um, and as he looked back in the South, he thought it was the, the chivalry the, of Sir Walter Scott that really was holding the South back. And there's some contemporaneous writing, as I'm sure you know, that kind of supports the same theory. Sure, Frederick yeah. Olmsted wrote yeah. about some of this too. Yeah. All right. That's great. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you very much. I learned a lot. I love the quotes you dropped throughout your talk. It was really cool. I just wanted to mention one that you said at the beginning. You said um, that he said that history doesn't repeat itself. It's like it rhymes. So I was like, what does that reflect about his view on history? I just wanted to know what you thought. Uh, well, I mean, I think he, uh, he, you know, he said that there's certain principles that uh, keep um, uh, reappearing on almost on a cyclical basis. You know, we have boom and bust economies. He went through a lot of those boom and bust economies. His father lost money every time they went through a panic. And um, so I think he thought that, that there's certain principles that sort of guide history and that people don't change and history doesn't change. And there was a comment earlier about his darker writing at the end of his life where he really was somewhat deterministic in that, uh, you know, people can't really change things that much. They are who they are, and, and uh, so hi history will repeat itself. And, and uh, he has several comments along those, those lines in his, in his writings. Um, on the other hand, uh, inconsistently, he was such a strong advocate of civic education, informed voters, and he thought the one exception was that people could be trained and educated for a better life, to be better citizens, to, to make democracy work more effectively. And he, um, one of his pet projects was the Children's Theater in New York, which he thought theater was a wonderful way to, to get um, young people interested in acting out how they can be better citizens. And so he, he was uh, uh, sponsored all these uh, children's theaters in New York, very disappointed that 
in the end, Andrew Carnegie wouldn't provide the funding that he needed for it. But, uh, um, you know, basically, he, he, uh, he saw history repeats itself and, and uh, things, and he, he, at, he started to read some of the Roman philosophers about the fall of Rome, and he started to get into this a little bit. He was very, you know, he died before World War I, but he saw it coming, and he was really concerned. He lived in Europe a lot in his later years. He was in, lived abroad more than he did in the United States, and he saw the anti-Semitism, and he saw uh, what was happening over there, and he was very, very pessimistic, and would go back to the writings on the, on the Roman Empire uh, to say that, you know, there's a good chance that civilization is going to ultimately fail. And some of the dark writings are, are pretty awful. He, he goes through, uh, um, you know, now for a year, when Adam, when, when Cain slew Abel, you know, and, and then he goes through all these ways that people kill each other and, and so forth, but it wasn't until uh, the, the Christian religion came along that we really developed excellent, really developed great weapons of mass destruction. And he said the rest of the world will look to the Christian nations, and he's thinking about Europe and the United States, not so much for their religion, but for their ability to develop these great weapons that can be used to kill so much more effectively. Because for all these years, we've been you know, using swords and muskets, and now we're going to have, and this was well before uh, you know, the atomic bomb and the, uh, the drones that we have now. So you know, he kind of predicted all of that. Um, I know you've mentioned most of his um, ideologies and things he stood for, but I'm kind of thinking, uh, do you see any of his ideologies and things that he represented being lived today, or you just see people just quoting what things he said to support their basic arguments? I think that, uh, you know, people do quote him all the time just to support whatever position they want, and I don't think people are very interested in, maybe they don't need to be, in, in what his particular philosophy was about something. Other than, I think, as you study something like Huckleberry Finn, uh, you get a sense of American history and the moral, and the moral issues that were um, involved and, uh, and learn from that. I think you learn more maybe from people are more interested in his storytelling and, and the message in his storytelling than to what his views are. Um, but, but they love to quote him. I mean, for, for any uh, particular purpose, there's usually some quote you can use. Um, I have a question. Um, Mark Twain is what kind of writer and why he is optimistic at the beginning, and but finally he is pessimistic. I mean, how come he have a such big difference attitude? How come he has what? Such big, such big difference attitude. Well, I mean, I think part of it is the, the tragedy that he, uh, you know, he, he went, he lost his wife, three of his four children, went through bankruptcy. Um, he, uh, I think it's the tragedy and then the ghosts that haunted him from his childhood, you know, repeated themselves in the tragedy of his adulthood. And I think that that, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, uh, a man who is a, uh, optimist, uh, an op a man who is a pessimist before 48 is wrong, and a man who is an optimist after 48 is wrong, or something along that. I haven't got the quote quite right. Maybe somebody else can uh, get it right, but it was something along those lines. I think he, uh, as he got older and, and faced a lot of tragedies, he became, became a pessimist. Thank you. Hi, my question is, do you think Mark Twain is a humoristic and did nothing harmful to the society or he is a soci social satirist spreading out many negative effects. Um, I'll leave that to the English uh, professors to answer. Um, you know, I think he's both. I, 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 he certainly was a satirist. I mean, he loved to, uh, um, he had wonderful satires about, I, you know, can't go into them all. They're just, he was the most prolific writer. I mean, he, and a lot of his work is lost. I mean, he destroyed a lot of his own work. But uh, he, uh, basically, when he started reporting in, in, in uh, Nevada, he, he used the Samuel Clemens when he was a serious reporter and Mark Twain when he, when he wanted to make a satire or, or humor. And he had these wonderful parodies of, uh, of the legislature. And, and the, um, uh, so I think he's a satirist. And, and uh, satirist may be first, and, and, uh, but remember it as a humorist. And, for his, his wit.